Proverbs 21.1, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Can you say that? The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And mountains move when we move by faith. So Lord, we're just asking you to open up the eyes of our understanding this morning. Thank you for making yourself so real to us already during intercession, during praise and worship, during the times of hearing the prophetic words that were coming forth to us. Lord, we recognize this is like nutrition for us. Our spirits need to be fed. We feed our bodies and we want to see our spirits fed and we want to grow into who you called us to be. Not an imitation of somebody else, Lord, but the identity that you gave us when we were conceived in our mother's womb, you were there and you know who you've called us to be. Help us to call that out in each other and to grow, like Paul said, to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that you have set for everyone in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I'll unpack it a little bit. Verse 11 in Nehemiah 1 says, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant me mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. You all know that, right? Those of you that have been saved a while, studied the book of Nehemiah, he was, even though he was taken captive, well, the Jews were taken captive and Babylon took over Jerusalem and all of the Jewish people that were taken captive ended up in Babylon. But here he is, Nehemiah had found favor with the king and he had elevated all the way up to this position of cupbearer. It was a risky job because if anybody wanted to poison the king, he had to taste the wine first and make sure that if he didn't die, then the king could have it. But if he wanted to kill the king, he might have been able to work something like slip a Mickey, right? So the... <laughs> So the king had to really trust him is the point. And over and over again, throughout the whole Old Testament, you find that the Jewish people, even though they were taken under difficult situations, you can think of Joseph, you can think of Esther, over and over again, they found favor. And that's, that's us, because we have that same inheritance, the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of obedience. If we choose to be obedient, the, bl the blessing comes. Amen? So he, he's, go, he's about to ask the king something, and you might know what that is, but I'll keep going for a minute first because the full verse in Proverbs says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And you might have heard Trisha's testimony from when she worked at the airlines, and before she was saved, the people that were on her job were Christians and ended up leading her to the Lord. And, and they saw a dramatic change, but... She was hoping for a promotion, even though she kind of knew that, that there wasn't, uh, she didn't have the track record at the time because the things she did before she was saved weren't exactly stellar. <laughs> but she still prayed. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, right? That was a fair analysis. She said it. I'll pull up the tape someday if, if anybody wonders. But the point is, she said, Lord, even though I may not deserve it, I'm still asking you if you'll do it. And, and, and he did. He opened up the door, and then where she went, everybody got saved. It was amazing, right? So the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. You might be asking for a promotion, and you forget to pray. It's not just based on, on the actions that you've done or the review that you get. It's also favor, and the favor comes through obedience. And, and what we could say is the boss should want 10 more people just like you, right? If we're really living the life of a disciple of Christ, there's no competition to that lifestyle when it comes to being honest and showing up on time and having a teachable attitude. It doesn't mean you don't ever complain or make a mistake, but, but we should be the people that the others are looking to as the example. That's, that's the way it's written in the book. That's, we work for the Lord. We're not doing it unto man. We're doing it unto him. Amen. All right, you know that I still work, so I care about this stuff. If you go back to verse 1 in, in Nehemiah, it says, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, right? He's with the king. So he lives in the palace with the king. One of my brethren came with me from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. Great distress and reproach. Now remember, he's in the palace. He's got free cable. He's got three meals a day. He, he works for the king. And we have to be careful in America that we don't think about our lives as being overly privileged, right? Even though we are, but we're called to help people. And like he, he doesn't have to inconvenience himself for anybody. He could just keep doing his job and he's going to be fine. But they said the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and the gates are burned with fire. So it was when he heard these words... He said, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. 
Now, I did my own research on it. You could do it on your, on your own too, but I don't even know that Nehemiah was ever even in Jerusalem up to this point. He was a Jew, but if you look at the dates and all of when the captivity happened, he was probably born in Babylon. But yet, there was such a resonance of the spirit of that blessing that comes from being, from having an identity as a son and daughter of the living king. The Jewish people, even though they were in captivity, they brought the Bible with them. They still kept writing it out. They still kept following after God because there had been prophecies that even though that, that Jerusalem was going to fall, Jeremiah said, 70 years and you'll be back. <laughs> That's a little tough, isn't it? Start smiling. You're going home. Yeah, but there's 62 years left. Well, you know what? Bloom where you're planted. <laughs> I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then as he's fasting and praying, he remembers this verse from Deuteronomy. It's a bigger, longer prayer. I won't give you the whole prayer. But it, I will gather them from exile. This is the Lord speaking. I will gather them from exile and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name, the city of Jerusalem. That was the place that God said, that's the city I love. That's where David went and established the capital. So I just wanted to give you a reason why all these uh, names are up here because there's, there's probably more to the story than you might realize if you haven't looked into it. And the theme there is that mountains move when we move by faith, right? So what does that mean? That we, we can't be overwhelmed by the way the situation looks. We have to be confident that when we're hearing the voice of the Lord, he'll still find a way to weave us through all the landmines that look like they could blow up at any minute and still get us where we have to go. I can only do what he's asking me to do, but if I don't do that, then I'm making the decision to disobey, or I could be bound by fear and just not able to step into that next role. That's not meant to shame anyone, but we do have life and death in our midst, right, when, when people are dying at a clip of 100,000 people died of overdoses last year in America. Like, insane amount of people, right? More people in one year died of overdoses than all the Vietnam War. How, how could that be? Well, people are desperately looking in the wrong places for the answers that they need, and we have the answers. So we should step through these opportunities that open. Do we expect you to be perfect? Of course not. That's part of the growing process is that you will make mistakes, but you learn from them and you keep on growing. So you can see over here, like if I'm looking, if, if you think of a timeline being this way from left to right, we're in Nehemiah right here, but there's all these other pieces that we're gonna, I'm going to try to connect, and I hope I can do that with you just in the time I have. But So if you go backwards from Nehemiah, the one closest to him were the two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, which we're going to talk about. They prophesied after the Babylonian captivity. Ezra, and, you know, Ram was just up here, and he was trained in Hebrew as a, as a Jewish uh, child would be in the New York area. So Ezra and, and Nehemiah are one book in the Hebrew Bible. So they're very closely linked together. And then Daniel, everybody remembers Daniel from the lion's den, and Isaiah. All of them are part of this one piece that we're looking at in the book of Nehemiah. There's a history here of, I think, like a resonance of what happens when you know your identity. And you can't back down when you know who you are. Somebody say amen. So here he is, Daniel, he's a slave. He was literally taken from Jerusalem in handcuffs, right, in chains. He was one of the people that was in Jerusalem and got taken out. And now he's in this strange land and yet he finds favor. Sound like Joseph? <laughs> right? Like there's some resonance of God's presence that causes us to find favor when we're obedient to him, even though he was a slave. He was taken captive as a slave. There was something about both of them, Joseph and Daniel. The people around them saw that there was something different. And they kept putting them in charge of things. And if you're in a prison... You know, maybe it's not that hard to stand out if you have good character. I don't know. Joseph clearly did. But Daniel here somehow finds his way to the king who had put out a demand. And a lot of you, I know, would know the story, but it was unusual in that it wasn't just to interpret a dream. Whoever was going to do this had to tell him the dream and then interpret it. Yeah, like, okay, you got till tomorrow morning. I'll give you a little extension. You come back tomorrow morning after you have a night to sleep on it. But if you don't tell it, you're dead in the morning. Think you could sleep that night? Like, 
wow, that's pretty good that he even fell asleep because he so trusted in the Lord. And while he was in that state, God gave him the answer. So he comes in. In verse 26, the king, this is King Nebuchadnezzar, the very one who had conquered Jerusalem. And he says, the king answered and said to Daniel, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And I love this answer because a lot of us would have said, maybe, what's it worth? You know, that's a little chip we get on our shoulder. It's not what he said. He, he feared the Lord. It didn't matter where he was. It didn't matter that he was a slave in Babylon and he wanted to be back. He was going to bloom where he was planted. So here he is, Daniel, way, way before what we're talking about today with Nehemiah. And he says, you know what, king? The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, astrologers, magicians, soothsayers, cannot declare to the king but there is a God. Oh, say that, okay? Somebody say it. But there is a God. You're, you're looking in the wrong places, king. There's only one person you need here in this situation, and that's God and one of his representatives that he talks to. But he talks to all of us because he's a father, and we're his sons and daughters. There's a God in heaven who reveals secrets and has made known to the king what will be in the latter days. And then we know that Dan goes on to interpret the dream. And then this is really quite the scene in verse 46 of that same chapter. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, the one who had ransacked Jerusalem and taken everything with him, this king falls on his face and bows down to Daniel prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to Daniel. I guess this guy really was impressed. Not only did he interpret the dream, he told me what the dream was. So he's plugged into the right channel. He's got to get put in charge of something because I'm sure he'll do a better job than other people. This is what they should be saying about us on our jobs, just saying. We're plugged into the same God. The king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of gods. Sounds like this right here, doesn't it? The Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. He wasn't special. He just had a relationship with God. All of us have a relationship with God. Just like God spoke to Daniel, he'll speak to us. Are we asking? <laughs> you have not. Because you don't ask. Dan to 248. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. No surprise. No surprise, unless the Lord builds the house, you know how to finish it. We'll just be laboring in vain. But when the Lord does build a house, promotion comes from above, not from the east, west, north, south. Promotion doesn't come from your boss, it comes from the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel had been in Jerusalem prior to the capture, so he would have known about Isaiah. Daniel was knowledgeable in the word because Isaiah was before Daniel was on the timeline. And then Daniel is also here in Babylon, not quite at the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah, but there's a transition that happens. Let me just show you. So we went from Daniel 2, now we're in Daniel 10, and now King Nebuchadnezzar's gone and there's a new king named Cyrus that takes the throne. And in the year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel. Here we go again. There's open heaven over his life. The king that was prior had installed Daniel as one of the leaders, the top leader of anybody who's, who's trying to contact good advice from God. That's a nice plaque to have on your desk. What's, what's your title? I am an open portal to heaven. <laughs> when people need advice, they come to me. I ask God, and he tells me. And if I get proud about that, I'll be smoked. <laughs> So I can't get proud about it. It's not me. It's just how great he is and my willingness to listen. So a message was revealed to Daniel. The point is that Daniel and Cyrus knew each other, okay, not just Nebuchadnezzar. So now we see that in Isaiah, which Daniel would have known about, Daniel's now an advisor to King Cyrus, and this is what Isaiah wrote prior to Cyrus ever being on the scene, possibly before he was even born. This is how prophets work. They see. They don't question what they're seeing. If you, if you hang around with Chuck Pierce, or if you remember the day he was here, he said, I don't know what it means. This is just what the Lord showed me. Because it just happened. He had gotten a download in the service that night during worship, and he got up here and said, 
I'm just going to tell you what he showed me during, during the service. And there was a root ride. Anybody remember that? Ten different things during this root ride. And it's like, don't ask me to tell you what it means. I'm just telling you what I saw. And we'll pray into what it means. So Isaiah clearly saw things that hadn't happened yet and still had enough confidence to write it down for the future. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm sorry, the Lord, your Redeemer, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. And that's in Isaiah 44. And he had already predicted in another portion of Scripture, I believe it's Isaiah 39, he said that you're going to be ransacked by Babylon. But they also knew Jeremiah's prophecy was only 70 years. So he's given them hope even before it happened. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Who says of Cyrus, he names him, hadn't even been born yet. Who says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. And to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. And then the next chapter, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, I will give you the treasures of the darkness. <laughs> Let's claim that one for us. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by name, even though you're not born yet, <laughs> am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I'm telling you, there's a heritage. There's a resonance of this Abrahamic covenant that travels through time. And if you're obedient, you get the blessings of that great cloud of witnesses that went before us. Just be obedient. That's what I'm saying. Like, you don't need a degree to be a Christian. Lots of missionaries go into places that people don't know how to read. That's why there's a whole ministry called Faith Comes by Hearing. Because all they can do is give them audio of the, of, of the Bible. And they still get saved. I'm all in favor of reading. Don't get me wrong. But it's not required. Amazing, right? Look at how God is moving even before the thing happened. Even though Isaiah said, Babylon's going to take you down, you're going to be restored. And I even know who the guy is. He's not even alive yet. But I know who's going to get you out of it. And then God speaks through Ezra, right? So there's this period when um, Nehemiah is in the, in the palace checking the wine for the king. But, you know, he clearly had a, a, a position of, of honor and respect. And now Ezra and Nehemiah, like I said, is, is one book, but you know, the way you would read it is Ezra first and then Nehemiah, because Ezra came with a man named Zerubbabel. Anybody remember this? That was probably on your finalist list for your kids when you were thinking about naming your son. Zerubbabel. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> but see, God uses who he chooses. Could you say that? He, he uses who he chooses. He, he's not looking at the same lens that you are. And you might think, well, how could God ever use Cyrus? He's not even a believer. Well, man, his name was in the book already. God uses who he chooses. Thus says Cyrus. <laughs> book of Ezra. Ezra is quoting the king and says, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given to me. He's given God the credit. I have a feeling Daniel had something to do with that. I, it's just conjecture. There's no proof that Daniel would have said, hey, do you know that your name is in the book? Well, can you look at somebody and say, do you know that your name is in the book? Oh, I hate when he does that. I hate when he does that. Now I have to read my Bible. It's hard to read the Bible. It's very convicting. <laughs> All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord has given to me. He's given God the credit. He's a pagan king. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And then chapter 3 comes, rebuilding the altar in Jerusalem. And that's really important. Trish has been talking a lot about rebuilding the altar. We will have another speaker later in October who wrote a book about this. So I won't get into that right now. But in your own life, the prayer altar should have been something that was emphasized to you during this fast. Anybody been doing the fast with us? 
Yeah, right? So then Wednesday, you can have your chubby hubby ice cream if you want. <laughs> you shouldn't, but you could if you wanted to. <laughs> so fasting's tough, right? I mean, it's really interesting. In Matthew, during the Sermon on the Mount, he said, when you fast. He didn't say if you fast, right? Like this isn't an optional thing. This is a part of our spiritual discipline. So another day's topic, but... The first thing they knew to do before fixing the wall around Jerusalem and before fixing the houses was start at the altar. That's why we fell into slavery in the first place, because we turned our back on the altar. They started intermingling with all the other tribes. Solomon, with all his wisdom, that was a huge mistake. He had 700 porcupines. Oh, concubines, sorry. I'm just saying, you know, prophetically... Yeah, 700. A man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife. That's singular. <laughs> Not 700 concubines and 300 wives. Guess he had a little problem in that area. But it rippled through and took the whole country down. Think about this, how God holds the leaders accountable. Right? This is no joke. Like The more you're asking him to give you responsibilities in the kingdom, the more he's going to expect. That's how it should be. That's how any of us would be with our children, right? He wants to make sure that you've got the right motives here, that you're not doing it for the wrong reasons. Anyway, another day's sermon too, but they start with the altar. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. So they, there's his name, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren rose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it. First thing they did. Now there's another prophet that you see listed here. His name is Haggai, right? So Isaiah was the prophet. Daniel was also a prophet and also a bunch of other things, clearly apostolic as well. And now Haggai comes, and I can't give you all the detail in between, but basically what happened is Cyrus said yes, and he released the funds, and they started the project. You might even remember in Ezra, there's a famous scene there because it says that when they dedicated the altar, the temple, some of the older men that had been there at the first temple started weeping. On the other side, there's all these people shouting for joy that they finally got that done, but then there's also people weeping. You know, you could feel those mixed emotions like, man, like why did we let that happen to us in the first place? You get what I'm saying? Like there was that regret. And I want to just say to America, which we all are here, part of America, let's not lose the freedom that we have. Right? We don't want to be the ones looking back and saying, oh, man, how did we miss what was happening around us and be so, what it says here, fear-based complacency. We get rigor mortis out of fear. And what prophets like to do is confront. <laughs> Period. Just end the sentence right there. First of all, that's part of their calling is to confront. We know that with John the Baptist, brood of vipers, right? That's confronting. But Haggai comes with a word, and he's going to confront this fear-based complacency. And I'm not, again, trying to shame anybody here, but we need to look in the mirror and say, is there anything in my life that is causing me to be stagnant because fear has frozen me? That's not one of the gifts of the Spirit. Complacency. Stagnation. Things that are alive are growing. Yeah. Amen? And you're all alive in here? Check, yeah. check the person next door. <laughs> yeah, so Haggai comes and he's like, he's not really worried about hurting anybody's feelings when he's going to release this word, right? Now, that's on this side. He says, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, saying, thus speaks the Lord of hosts. The people say the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple lies in ruins? That's one of those rhetorical questions that you know the answer. No, that shouldn't be the time. But we've been frozen in fear-based complacency. That's what the prophet does. He comes in and prods us and says, wake up. You're missing your opportunity here. The money that you're using to build your house was given to build the temple. So, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's usually not a compliment. <laughs> 
when it comes from a prophet. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Doesn't sound like the Lord's building that house. Sounds like they've gotten off track of what he was wanting them to do. And now it's not just that they don't get the blessing of obedience. They come out from under the covering of the blessing. Because they're taking what was given to the Lord and using it for themselves. And using fear as an excuse. And if you saw the movie, I've said it before, but if you saw the movie uh, Sound of Freedom, the man is clearly a very heroic guy that the story is about. But his wife was the one that said, you know, we're going to have to stand before God someday. And if you think I'm going to stand there and, and, and know that you could have saved those children, but you took the easy way out and took your pension, I'd rather live in a tent. Husbands, ask your wives to listen to what I just said. I'd rather live in a Sorry, just kidding. I'd rather live in a tent than have to stand before God and have to give an account that we took the easy way out when we knew those kids could have been saved. <laughs> Man, I just want to watch another Netflix. I want to binge. I just want to watch another series. I want to be distracted and just forget about the, the responsibility. Well, let's just wake up. Say, no, there's an amazing opportunity all around us the world has never been more hungry for the gospel than they are right now. All right, so God clearly is frustrating this situation because they have walked outside the blessing of obedience. They weren't doing what God asked them to do. And thus says the Lord of hosts, in case you didn't get it the first time, consider your ways. Just a few verses later. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home... I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house that is in ruins while your, every one of you runs to your own home. Sounds like it could be the American church. Could be that we're happy in our, our little bubble here, but we don't get touched by the, by the pain of the world. But we're supposed to be people who live in that intersection between heaven and earth. And God came into the middle of our pain and met us. So the church is supposed to get into the middle of the world's pain and meet them. And not call out the problem. Tell them there's an answer. There's good news here, right? You guys know that. Now here's this other prophet named Zechariah. And I, I quoted it a little bit earlier today. Just thought of the picture while we were praying in the spirit about this wall of fire around the city. And that's not what this relates to, but... But he was alive at the same time that Zerubbabel was trying, Ezra and, and Zerubbabel were trying to get this foundation laid. And they did, but they stopped it because they were threatened by the local government. They were threatened by the opponents to say, you better stop or we're going to take you out. That's a summary, okay? And here comes Zechariah. And I know a lot of you are familiar with this verse that I'm about to read, but you might not know this is where it comes from. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now remember, Haggai just was warning them. And saying, you've lost your way. You said you wanted to come back from Babylon. See, like, we got to remember that, too, because not everybody that was offered to come back went back to Jerusalem. Because you can get so used to the slavery that you just shrug your shoulders and say, nah, I'm, I'm good here. I'm just going to I'll run the table, they would say, in pool, right? I'm just going to spend the rest of my life here and figure it out. A known devil is, worse, is, is better than an unknown devil. That's what they say. No. See, but there's a radical remnant that decided, we don't have it good here. We're not free. No, don't get used to slavery. But if you've been born into it, maybe it's harder to know what it might be like to be free. But I believe there's something in everybody's heart that wants it. They want freedom. They don't want to be bound by addiction. But, but the mountain's only going to move if we move. See, we don't just wait. We just do something. You take a step when the, when the priests were going to take that ark across the river, they had to take the first step into the water before the water stopped. Peter had to step out of the boat. The mountain moves if we move first. Amen? Not in foolishness. But here's what Zechariah is saying to Zerubbabel. Look, you know that you were given these funds, and this thing has ground to a halt, and the building has stopped, and the people are using it for their own good. You can't let yourself 
be intimidated by this because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You're not getting this thing done because of your good ideas. You represent the king. So stop looking at the opposition in the natural and just be obedient and do what he told you to do. <laughs> yeah, we say amen, but it's hard to do, isn't it? We just have to be honest and say, most of us have probably could think of times right now where we had an opportunity and we didn't do it and we regretted it later, right? But that's okay. That's all part of the growing process. God loves us. He gave them talents and he said trade. And they traded and he didn't favor one over another. He just was critical of the one who buried their talent, right? That's, that's where we can't say we didn't at least try. Fair enough? I'm starting to spit on the front row. That's a good sign. Wait a minute. Who are you, great mountain? We just sang that. Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone and shouts of grace, grace to it. Can you say it with me? Who are you, great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. That's what we're supposed to see in the spirit. Mountains move when we move by faith. Yes, there's intimidation coming. Zerubbabel had enough reasons that would have been listed. But they said they'd do this. They said they'd do that. They're like, well, which are you going to believe, God or these people? God sent us here. He provided. He predicted that Cyrus would be born even before he was born. You see what I'm saying? Like how this resonance of the history gives you confidence that if you're stepping out in something that you know is the Lord, it doesn't matter what the opposition is saying. Mm. Walk by faith, not by sight. And then we go back to, I'll come back to Nehemiah over here now, okay? Because remember, he, he broke down crying when he heard the condition of the children of Israel and that the, the, the walls were still broken down, the people were in great distress, and he's still in the palace, but now this is chapter 2. And I said, reckoning faith seizes the moment. And that word reckoning, if you have a finance background, that's what they used to say. Like we would say, did you balance your checkbook this, this month? Did you come to a reckoning, right? Both sides, in and out. Did you balance it? We have to do a reckoning. Give an account of your stewardship is what it says in the New Testament when Jesus is talking. In fact, Potiphar said to Joseph, I don't even need to know the balance in the checkbook. I trust you so much. I don't even need to know. I know you would not cheat me because you fear the Lord. He didn't say it that way, but that was the message. <sighs> Very convicting. These cloud of witness people are really sharp. <laughs> so reckoning faith says, you know what? That's what Esther did. Maybe you're here for such a time as this. If I die, I die. But nobody else is going to have the opportunity that I have right now. And if the king's in a bad mood and he takes me out, God had already said through Mordecai, you don't have to do this, but if you don't, God will raise somebody else to do it. <laughs> In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that was his job, I took the wine and gave it to the king. And now I'd never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Now, let's just have a reality check. And you know, like, how many people would like to have Nehemiah's job? Right? So one of the requirements on the job description is you have to stay happy because you got it really good, bud. You got it good. You live in the palace. You got free cable. You get good food. There's a lot of people that would like this. So if you come in sad, you get fired. Or maybe you put some poison in my cup. Because <laughs> I've never seen you sad before. And then I, it says, I became dreadfully, dreadfully afraid, Nehemiah said. I said to the king, may the king live forever. No poison in the wine. Why should, you, why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste? And its gates are burned with fire. That took some courage. Because all of a sudden now a slave is saying, like, what are you saying that I'm not getting the job done? Because the project had started. So the king could have been threatened. And then the king said, what do you request? So there's a little spark. Okay, he hasn't killed me yet. My head is still attached. Cool. Verse 5, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Good idea. I prayed. <laughs> You're seeing this window open, the first thing you do, you don't blurt anything out, you just pray. Okay? I want to miss the landmines, Lord. 
Show me where to go. Lead me not into temptation right now. Deliver me from evil and let me say what you want me to say right now. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. <sighs> there. I said it. Tell me no, kill me. Like Esther, if he holds out his scepter, I'm good. If not, nice knowing you. I think that it could have been that way here. And then the king said to me, the queen, also sitting beside him, nice little parenthetical statement, how long will your journey be? And he's like, yes. That means yes. I'm taking it as a yes. How long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time when I return. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and I'm not listed it here, but basically I want letters from, to the governors. I want a letter to the guy that runs the forest so I can get as much timber as I need. I need carpenters. And by the way, give me the money to build my own house while I'm there because I'm going to need a house to live in too. That's what an apostolic person does. He already planned on getting a yes answer, and he knew what to ask for. Amen. Second Chronicles said God responds to the prayers of faith. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Anybody know this verse? What's the rest of it? To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. I could just see that, right? Like binoculars, and God's looking, and he goes to Shushan, and he sees Nehemiah weeping and praying and fasting and calling out to God, what can I do about this? I don't want to stay in the palace. I'm willing to go back there. And let this thing proceed. But I'm going to need a lot of favor, Lord, can you? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Got any loyal hearts in the room? Okay, good. Just checking. So here's a name of God that you might know, and I'm going to tie it into Romans, verse, uh, Romans chapter 8. The heart-searching Father God. See, we could have gotten that name from 2 Chronicles 16. He's shown himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. He looks at our heart. Search my heart, O God. Reveal if there be anything in me that doesn't belong there. I don't want it in there. That's a brave prayer because he'll show you. In verse 19, you might not see the connection yet, but hopefully you will. Creation itself is on tiptoe with expectation, eagerly awaiting the moment when God's children will be revealed. You're telling me that creation is waiting? Yes, because when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, death came to creation too. And creation is not new age, okay? I'm just reading you the Bible here. Creation is not a person, but it's alive, and it was made by God. So it's like the whole universe is waiting, what I said, for you and me to start moving by faith to move the mountains that are stopping all the sin from happening in our region. We know that the entire creation is groaning and going through labor pains together <laughs> up until the present time. And we too who have the fruits, first fruits of the Spirit's life within us are groaning within ourselves as we eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our body. And I don't know what's causing you to groan right now, but for me, it's what's happening to the children in the schools. And, and this, this really uh, perverse curriculum that was illegal when I was that age is now being presented with my tax dollars. I, I, don't, I can't, I, that's not okay. It's never going to be okay to me. So... That's my groaning. Like, what can I do to make a difference on that particular topic? Because that's what he highlighted for me. doesn't mean that it has to be what he highlights for you. But somewhere the church said it's not okay for Christians to be involved in politics. That was a lie from the pit of hell. Sorry. It just was. We're not going to be involved in our communities and run for school board? Like, of course we should. Anyway, that's under the bridge. But it, verse 26 says, in faith-filled hope, the Spirit comes alongside and helps us in our weakness. Man, that's worth thinking about. Faith-filled hope. Nehemiah goes before the king. Faith-filled hope. Daniel is able to sleep knowing that he's going to die tomorrow if he can't interpret the dream. First of all, figure out what the dream was. That's a pretty tall order. Nope. Faith-filled hope. That's what Christians in the early days, if you read historians, that was one of the major things that was different about the Christians is that they had hope and the pagans didn't. The Spirit comes alongside and helps us in our weakness. 
We don't know what to pray for as we ought to. But that same spirit pleads on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. The searcher of the heart knows what the spirit is thinking. The Father knows what the Spirit is doing inside of us. You all know you have Holy Spirit inside you, right? And that they speak the same language. So even when you don't know what to say, the Spirit of God speaks to the Father on your behalf. The Spirit pleads for God's people according to God's will. And then this is just a little commentary, and I'm almost done. The word searcher comes from a root, a root not a woot, a root, which suggests someone lighting a torch. Okay, so this is going way back in the old days. They have to light a torch. They don't have a flashlight. And going slowly around a large dark room full of all sorts of things, looking for something in particular. Crowded room. You've got this torch. It's dark, and you're looking for something. The thing God wants to find above all else, because he's the heart searcher, and in Paul's opinion, what he ought to find in all Christians is the sound of the Spirit groaning in us. So if you didn't need anything else to help you know how important prayer is, that should be it right there. You have not because you ask not. And I'm guilty. You know, when I first married Trisha, I didn't understand prayer the way she did, and she opened my eyes amazingly to that and many of the other people if you look at a lot of the people that come here and speak Chuck Pierce Cindy Jacobs Ed Silvoso we're doing a book right now by Ed Silvoso prayer was number one on the list before the prophetic was released in them they were prayer warriors still are John and Cheryl Price right that's what they're known for that's not always what the church is known for I'll leave it at that I'm almost done God does not stand apart from our pain do you believe that you believe that Holy Spirit knows what to pray even when you don't have the words? Good. He comes to dwell in the middle of our pain, in the person and the power of the Spirit. Precisely at the point when we are struggling to pray, the Spirit is most obviously at work. We may lack the words, but the searcher of the hearts is continually in communion with the Spirit that dwells in the hearts of his people. That would be all of us. Make no mistake, it says in Galatians 6, 7, God can't be mocked. We can't complain that we don't have life the way we want it to if we haven't also sown the seed of prayer. Like, where's the burden? Nehemiah did not have to leave that palace. He had a really good, but he had a burden. God put a burden on his heart. That doesn't mean we all have the same burden. But to have none makes it seem like we're, we're bound by that, that fear that freezes us. Complacency, fear-based complacency. I might lose my job. I mean, I have to. I had to give somebody another vaccine exemption this week. Anyway, I'll leave that one for another time. <laughs> Make mo no mistake, God can't be mocked. What you give is what you get. What you sow, you harvest. Are you even asking Holy Spirit to show you what to do every day? He's in there, but he doesn't force his way on you. You've got to access what's already in you. And the word, those who sow seeds in their flesh will reap, oh, I'm sorry, will harvest destruction from their sinful nature. Wait a minute, though. I thought when I'm, I'm Christian, that old nature died. What's your answer? Paul must have been making a mistake here. They could still be reaping seeds of destruction from their sinful nature. Well, the sinful nature tries to resurrect itself, too. You could kill it, but it still tries to resurrect itself. But God, amen? But God, I know I'm going long. I'm almost done. Those who sow seeds in the Spirit shall harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. This is what I really wanted to get to. We can stand. Say it with me. Mountains move. When we move by faith. I'm going to start moving first so the mountains will move. I'm going to fast the next three days. I'm going to press in and ask for God to show me what this new year is about. Not just in general, but what it means for me personally. Thank you, Lord. No, you don't have to keep repeating now. I'm just saying, like, we need ownership. We can't ride the coattails of other people. We can admire people in the kingdom, and we should. But at the end of the day, you're only standing in front of that seat before God by yourself. 
right? So it's up to me to be the one who's intense enough about this to want to care to make a difference. And, and we do. And I love what it says here. We, may we never tire of doing what is good and right before our Lord. You know, that's not easy, is it? Sometimes we get out of balance, but he's, he's really helping us with this underline here. May we never tire of doing what is good and right before the Lord. Because in his season, we shall bring in a great harvest if we can just what? Just persist. You know that example of the, of the boxing ring? I think it might have been Muhammad Ali. And, and all the, the trainer kept saying is, look, I know you're exhausted. I know it's late in the fight. But that other guy is not going to answer the bell. And if you just get up out of this seat and you go in the middle of the ring, they're going to call the fight because he can't move out of his seat. So sometimes all you have to do is show up. You just have to show up. And the enemy already tried to mail it in, and you win. That's what he's saying. May you never tire of doing what is good and right before the Lord. That doesn't mean you don't have boundaries. You have to have healthy boundaries of what you say yes and no to. But when, that's the beauty. When you know you're hearing the voice of the Lord, that's much less likely to happen. Amen? Be a great harvest if we can just persist. So here it is. I'm going to finish with this. So seize any opportunity the Lord gives you to do good things and be a blessing to everyone. Amen. Lord, I pray this would be second nature that this would be second nature to us. Anyone here who is tired right now, anyone here who is under the weight or, or feeling that uh, freeze, that stagnation, that complacency that comes from that fear that locks us up, Lord, I release them right now from that to be who you call them to be. You gave us the authority that we have. It's not from ourselves, but you gave it to us. And as we see people going down all around us in all different emotional ways and financial ways, we are supposed to step in the gap. And I say, strengthen us to step in that gap, Lord, that we could be the difference maker for your kingdom in the earth. Amen. So I just want to end by saying, if there's somebody here that doesn't know the Lord, or if you're in a difficult situation, maybe you did know the Lord at one time and you've fallen away, there's thousands and thousands of testimonies of people that came back after falling away that I'm aware of. So we know that's true. It's never too late with God. You have not committed the unpardonable sin, okay? I know you might know it's there. That happens to some people. They think that they can't be saved. The, the altar is open for anyone who wants to be in relationship with a living God. That's how this works. It's not religion. It's not church membership. It's just saying, I heard good news today, but I'm not living in that, and I want it. And if that's you, we'll just lead you in a prayer. We're just going to invite the Lord to come in. And anybody else here who's struggling or dealing with any kind of issues, we're here to help you with all of them. There's nobody on our team that hasn't struggled with plenty of issues. And it's not because of those. It's that we appreciate it, that God has the power to change us. Amen? So let's pray out loud together. Heavenly Father, I recognize I've got mountains in my life. And I don't have the faith yet to move that mountain. But I heard today that you can strengthen my faith. And that if I walk properly in alignment with you, in obedience to you, and I surrender my will to your will, and I accept you as my Savior, you'll fill me with the truth of your word and the power of your spirit. Not based on my merit, but based on your love for me. I choose to turn away from a sinful life. That's a choice you got to make. I choose to turn away from a sinful life. And I'll say, and I choose to turn to you. I see you by faith with your arms wide open, ready to receive me. And I see these people around me ready to help me to know what to do next. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I enter into your family now with a spirit of adoption. And I call out to you, Father God, receive me in Jesus' name. Amen. And he will. Anybody who says that prayer, he will receive you. Don't say, well, you don't know the sins I've committed and you don't know all the pain I've been in in my life. Don't worry about it, okay? 
If you said the prayer, come on up to the altar. We will agree with you. We'll stand in agreement. And we will mentor you to the best of our ability. There's so many people here. That would be the best news that would happen today. Is to know another name got written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that, that would be you. Your birthday, September 10th, in the spirit. In Jesus' name. Lord, I bless your people. I thank you for the radical remnant that is here, willing to move mountains because that's who you are in us and we want to operate in what you told us that we could do. I release them now, Lord, to do your work this week and to come back together with testimonies of your miracles in our lives. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Prayer? Yeah, we have prayer ministry here, so you can just come up that aisle and you can work with the team members that are on the prayer ministry. Have an awesome day.